Hello and welcome to this lecture on personality testing and employee selection. Based upon recent statistical advances, the assessment of personality as a predictive tool in the selection process has exploded. Rarely is a job posted on the web that does not have a link to a personality test as one of the hurdles to getting hired. Let's get started. Let's start with a simple definition of personality. Personality is a largely innate, somewhat immutable predisposition toward similar behaviors across situations and time. I say largely innate because numerous studies of identical twins reared apart by different parents have revealed that these genetically identical people share over half of the variability in their traits with each whom they have never met. In actuality, it's around 51% of one's personality that is caused by genetics and the other 49% is a result of one's environment. If we get half of our genes from one parent and the other half from the other parent, we can see why our personalities are not unlike those of our parents. Let's look at this graph on the slide. If we place time or age on the horizontal axis and the so-called trait level, more on that later, on the vertical axis, we can graph the relationship between age and trait. We see that in the early years of one's life, there is great variability in trait level. For example, sometimes we are completely agreeable infants, and sometimes we are totally disagreeable little tantrum throwers who want what we want when we want it, and not a minute later than that. As we age, our personality tends to settle in on an amount of the trait that we possess or display to others. By the time we are around 30 years old, our personalities tend to crystallize around a certain trait level. So what is that trait level? If we hearken back to the lecture on measurement and assigning numbers to things, we can assign a number to the amount of a trait that we possess. So some people who are low in agreeableness or who are completely disagreeable, if you will, get a low number on agreeableness. And those with ample levels of agreeableness get a high score on agreeableness. You'll note that we stated that low agreeableness is a proxy for high agreeableness. That's because personality traits can be thought of as a dimension ranging from low to high. We assign words to describe the polar opposite endpoints sometimes, and it just so happens that the opposite of agreeableness is disagreeableness. Let's move on. HR selection is about measurement. So how can selection experts measure personality? The best way to find out about someone's personality is to ask them. Most people tend to answer honestly when completing a personality test. So self-report questionnaires are actually the gold standard of measuring personality. These self-report questionnaires include several brief statements or questions to which you indicate your level of agreement or disagreement. There is no correct or incorrect answer. While slightly less valid than self-report, we sometimes use other report questionnaires in the research world. With an other report, we ask someone who knows you really, really well to complete the questionnaire about you. That someone is usually a parent, sibling, or spouse, and not some poker buddy or beer bong opponent. Other report personality scores are not likely to be legally defensible, so do not use them in an employee selection scenario. Use the gold standard, self-report. Some inventories list a series of trait adjectives that an applicant can indicate how much the trait adjective describes them personally. These traits are from what is called the lexical model of personality. In every lexicon or collection of words used in every culture, there are common words used to describe personality traits. Think for a minute about another language you might speak. In English, we describe some people as friendly. In German, that word is freundlich. In Spanish, the word is amigable. We're sure that there is an equivalent word in languages as diverse as Arabic, Mandarin, Chinese, Swahili, and even Klingon. That's because all cultures recognize that people have differing levels of friendliness, and they use the equivalent of the word friendly to describe those people. So researchers collected every word to describe personality in almost every language and asked those language speakers to rate themselves on those words. They then submitted that data to exploratory factor analysis to see if certain words clump together, or rather if scores on those adjectives are strongly or weakly correlated with each other, to use the language of factor analysis. What they found is that it doesn't matter what language you speak. 
but there are groups of synonyms that clump together into distinct trait groups. The behavioral descriptor tests are based upon the fact that personality predisposes or causes one to behave in a certain way. In fact, much of what we know about personality is based upon the backwards inference regarding the relationship between behaviors and traits. For example, if someone shows up to work on time every day and never misses a TPS report deadline and never ever calls in sick, we can reasonably infer that they have high levels of conscientiousness, which as we know is characterized by dependability, responsibility, and diligence. Thus, we infer that they are conscientious because we have witnessed behaviors inferring that they are. Some applicants will lie and fake and try and present themselves as something they are not. A small amount of what is called impression management is a socially acceptable manner of behavior, like when you shine your shoes before the big job interview, even though they may never have been shined in the full five years you've owned them. You want to put on a good impression. Lying and faking to the extreme, on the other hand, is detectable via a host of measures of what is called socially desirable responding, or SDR. And SDR is of two types, impression management and self-deception. Impression management is the main concern here, as it is an overt attempt at presenting oneself as something they are not. I won't even go into the nuances of self-deception, but most good personality inventories include some items to detect impression management. So don't worry about that too much. Let's move on. Another type of personality assessment is a group of projective techniques that require specialized training and usually a license as a school counseling or clinical psychologist. As you might guess, these sorts of techniques are expensive since psychologists' time is not cheap. With these, we ask a person to respond to an ambiguous stimuli, and based upon what they say, they infer certain traits about them. The prototypical technique is the Rorschach ink blot, where you make statements about what you see in the blot, blot of ink. Other methods include the thematic apperception test, or TAT, with the TAT, for example, you might be asked to explain what you see in a drawing of two men in an office. One is old and seated, and the other is young and standing. If you say, for example, that in this drawing, the young man is thanking the old man for his years of mentorship and how he has helped him become a better person, you might infer respect for authority, kindness, and trust. If, on the other hand, you say that the young man is asking the old man when he's going to retire so he, the young man, can step into the old man's job and show everyone how the job is supposed to be done, you might infer something completely different. Lastly, on this short list of objective techniques is the minor sentence completion scale where you ask a person to finish a sentence. For example, the psychologist asks a person to finish the following sentence. When I encounter a problem, I and then the person finishes the sentence. The big drawback to these tests is that they are notoriously unreliable. If two licensed psychologists are in the room with the person at the same time, their inter-rater agreement is usually horrible. Moreover, test-retest reliability is extremely low. As we know, reliability is a necessary but not sufficient condition for validity and validity is about the relationship between scores on a selection test and scores on a performance appraisal. As if all this wasn't bad enough, it can be construed of as a medical test because it takes a licensed psychologist, counselor, or psychiatrist to conduct and interpret the test. Medical tests cannot be administered until after a job offer has been extended. Personality tests are administered well before a job offer is extended. Let's move on. Let's turn back now to using a selection interview to measure personality. Typically in an interview, when we think we are measuring overall personality, we are actually only measuring or assessing conscientiousness. Think about it. We ask questions like, tell me about a time when you went above and beyond the call of duty in your last job. Or we ask, what would you do if you knew a coworker was falsifying his TPS report? Both of those have at least some element of conscientiousness in them. 
Since most of us are not licensed psychologists or psychological scientists, we tend not to do as good a job of assessing applicant personality as we think we do, and most certainly as perhaps we need to do. So when we rate an applicant's personality, our scores as the interviewer tends to only moderately correlate with job performance. And some of this error is based upon the fact that most humans tend to attribute causality to something internal to people and not external to them. That is, we think that the reason things happen is not because of a situation, but rather it's because of someone's personality. This is called the fundamental attribution error, and it's a naturally occurring source of measurement error that we must guard against. The fundamental attribution error, write this down, is when an observer attributes causality to something internal to an actor instead of external to the actor. For example, suppose that you see that an employee who's known to be quite clumsy has fallen off of a ladder. You slowly saunter over to him as he screams in pain, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. You move slowly because his past clumsiness indicates to you that this bout of clumsiness is probably due to his own two left feet, so to speak. As you get closer, you see that three rungs of the ladder on which he was standing have broken in half, and his fall was because of something external to him and not internal to him, as you originally surmised. So, of course, you reach down and push the button on his life alert monitor. Okay, actually, you call an ambulance because he has a double compound fracture of his left tibia. Another source of error when using interviews to assess or measure personality is that we sometimes make great inferences about the amount of a trait based upon very small amounts of behavior. For example, we might ask of an applicant, tell me about a time when you submitted a late report and were reprimanded. If they reply, I've never been late with a report because unbeknownst to you, they've never had a job that entailed the submission of reports, they technically are not lying but you might infer high levels of conscientiousness from their reply. This might be a grievous error. However, there is one way to slightly, very slightly increase the validity of a personality assessment obtained in a job interview. That would be by administering a free-flowing, unstructured interview. The twists and turns in such conversation might yield much richer data on which you can make a more valid inference. But I strongly urge against doing unstructured interviews that make it difficult to compare applicants because each applicant is likely asked different questions, so scoring it is like comparing apples to oranges. If you recall from the lecture on interviews, we sometimes think we can assess an applicant's personality from an interview action, interaction, but people tend to be on their best behavior in an interview. If you want to avoid lawsuits based upon assigning scores for applicants' personality assessment obtained in a job interview, you should specifically and professionally measure the traits of their personality. Of course, all of this first depends on whether you have validated that certain trait levels are predictive of job performance. Alternatively, you could consult one of the many, 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 many well-done meta-analyses that are available and generalize validity from them. For small firms, I recommend validity generalization via published meta-analyses. Let's move on. Personality researchers have settled on five big traits that explain most but not all of human personality. These groups are as the following. Extroversion which entails being sociable, gregarious, assertive, talkative, and active. A common personality test item to measure extroversion is, I tend to say what I think about things. On this item, you would indicate your level of agreement or disagreement using a Likert response scale. Agreeableness entails being courteous, flexible, trusting, cooperative, and tolerant. A test item is, I tend to be trusting of others. Conscientiousness is all about being careful, dependable, organized, and responsible. A personality item used to measure conscientiousness is, I approach most of my work steadily and persistently. Emotional stability has the facets of anxious, depressed, angry, embarrassed, worried, and insecure. We might use the following item to measure emotional stability. 
whenever I'm by myself, I feel vulnerable. Now, sometimes emotional stability is known by its polar opposite endpoint of neuroticism. High scores on this item would indicate high neuroticism and by definition, low emotional stability. Openness to experience entails being imaginative, cultured, intelligent, original, and broad-minded. We measured this trait with an item like, I enjoy eating in new restaurants that I know nothing about. Openness used to be called intellect, and then it evolved into the odd word intellectance. Both of those terms tend to be confused with intelligence, which is different from personality. Openness to experience is the generally accepted term now. Let's move on. Here's a list of personality traits shown to be desirable for certain jobs. Let's look at the job of executive. Ambition is especially important. It takes ambition just to rise to the level of executive. For a supervisor, the trait of nurturance is important as those jobs require that the incumbent strives to get the most effort and performance out of subordinates. A salesperson without ample extroversion will likely not perform well. A secretary without dependability will fail at that job. An insurance agent who doesn't cross their T's and dot their I's, so to speak, can lose clients. A newspaper writer without emotional stability will not investigate tragic or sad events. For a carpenter, being dependable is especially important. Dependability is a facet of conscientiousness. We also don't want emotionally unstable carpenters, especially when they work with nail guns and power tools. That should make some sense. Now we see that conscientiousness is a desirable trait for almost all of these jobs. In fact, of the big five personality traits, conscientiousness is the strongest predictor of job performance, regardless of what job we are examining and regardless of how we measure job performance. Not only is the measurement of personality important, but the measurement of job performance is important too. One can measure job performance subjectively or through an objective quantification procedure. And as you know, we spent some time on that in the job performance lecture already. Let's move on. As with most selection tests, there are legal issues associated with personality tests too. One must comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act when examining personality. If a test is administered or interpreted by a healthcare professional like a psychiatrist or a licensed psychologist, it might be measuring psychopathology, which is a disability covered by the ADA. We cannot discriminate against otherwise qualified persons with mental disorders in any employment decision. A recent court case ruled that the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, or MMPI, is no longer allowed for employment decisions because it is designed to diagnose psychopathology. Some scores on the MMPI will indicate an impairment, and we cannot use the presence or absence of an impairment in a hiring decision. Incidentally, the MMPI was one of the first personality inventories to include an indicator of impression management with its K scale or Lie scale. Since personality is such a deeply personal thing, you should not allow non-HR personnel and other decision makers to see scores on personality tests. I suggest that one should also not post their MBTI, Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, psychometric crap, or the results of their colors test, ugh, worse, on their cubicles, as far too many firms do. Let's move on. In sum, there is some evidence that personality characteristics can be grouped into five broad dimensions. Most of these dimensions matter in most jobs, but conscientiousness matters the most in all jobs. It helps mightily that most managers intuitively believe that personality traits matter at work. Any manager who has disdain for the role of personality in job performance or any other human behavior is just woefully uninformed. Meta-analytic data shows these traits can be relevant predictors of work performance. Such data is gathered in a validity generalization, so use it instead of running your own super expensive validity study. 
Moreover, because personality is not highly correlated with other useful selection tests like biodata or the weighted application blank, it contributes incremental validity to the prediction of success at work. That is, personality explains variability or variance in job performance above and beyond that which is explained by other selection tests. Lastly, there is little to no adverse impact. That is, mean scores are quite comparable across racial or ethnic groups and between men and women. There is simply no difference in the mean level of, say, conscientiousness between blacks and whites or between men and women. So we are typically safe to use personality test as a selection tool. Let's move on. On this and the next few slides, you'll see some shameless self-promotion with the first page of some of my own peer-reviewed research on personality traits. Most of my research on personality is involved with measurement issues associated with so-called dark traits, like narcissism, entitlement, and Machiavellianism. If you're suffering from insomnia, dig up one or two of these and they may help. Just kidding. Well, thanks. That's all, folks.